Hello, good evening everyone. Thank you very much to, for joining us and it's fantastic to see so many of you online tonight for our presentation with Dr. Helen Benham. Um, before we get into it tonight, I just want to cover a few housekeeping things. Um, so any technical issues that happen tonight, which come with doing something like this online, just take, um, type in that um, chat box down the bottom corner of the screen there and someone from the conferencing platform will be in touch with you. So just type anything down there, you know, if you can't hear or there's lag or whatever it might be, just make note of it down there. Alternatively, you can also call uh, 1-800-733-416 and someone will be able to help you out there as well. Um, also, um, feel free to pop any questions you have throughout the presentation this evening down in that box. We will be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation and collating them and then asking Dr. Benham them at the end. So feel free to pop them down there at any point during the presentation and we will um, come to them at the end um, of, the, of the presentation here. Um, and also just important to note that the chat is um, unprivatized. So everyone will be able to see anything that's popped in that um, chat box. So if you have got anything that's a little bit curly or personal or, and that you want um, answered by one of our health educators, feel free to email myself at james, J-A-M-E-S, at arthritis.org.au and we'll give you some, um, give you some information if we, if we can help you with any, um, any really specific questions there that you don't want necessarily passed on to everyone throughout the chat box. Um, and also, um, the recording, um, this, sorry, this webinar is being recorded tonight. So if you do run into any issues or you can't stay for the whole thing, um, just to let you know that we will make it available to you. So you will be able to watch it at a later date and the quality will be, will be as good as it can be on that. So it's usually a lot, a lot higher quality than the live webinar if you have any issues in that regard. Okay, so um, as it's um, been said um, on the website or wherever you've heard about this webinar, tonight it's all about over-the-counter therapies and some complementary therapies in rheum um, rheumatology. And we're lucky enough to have Dr. Helen Benham speaking tonight. Um, Dr. Benham um, divides her time between clinical practice as a rheumatologist and as a translational researcher at the PA hospital. She has a very strong interest in implementing science um, and also the translation of research findings into clinical practice. So uh, Dr. Benham is very well versed in being able to cover this tonight. Um, Dr. Benham has also been a devoted member of our board for a number of years now and is currently our Vice President. So we're very happy to have um, Dr. Benham on board um, in that capacity as well. So without um, any further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Benham um, to, for tonight's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's very nice to be here and I'm glad that there's so many people on the line. So tonight I am going to talk about over-the-counter therapies um, and that is inclusive of, um, I guess, mostly analgesia that we can get over-the-counter um, and also any evidence that there is for some of the complementary or, or alternative therapies. I think it's really uh, difficult of a topic because it's so very, very broad, but we'll do what we can and I've left lots of time for questions at the end, so be happy to, um, to answer where I can. So I'm just trying to advance my slide here. There we go. So tonight we're going to talk about musculoskeletal diseases in general, but I have narrowed it down to talk about osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthritis, and in particular rheumatoid arthritis. And that's really because those two conditions are really where we have the most evidence, or in fact where we have any good scientific evidence in regards to some of the over-the-counter therapies and the complementary medicines. So we'll talk about some of the complementary medicines and we'll talk about some of the over-the-counter um, medicines. And it was requested of me to also talk about the changes to prescribing codeine, which will be coming into effect uh, in February of 2018, um, because it's a really important issue for many people living with arthritis and rheumatological conditions, musculoskeletal conditions. Um, uh, so it's an important thing for us to have a talk about tonight. So in regards to complementary and alternative therapies, 
It is very, very common. So two out of three Australians have ever used a complementary medicine. And because of that, as you can imagine, it's a billion dollar industry in Australia. The, about a quarter of Australians um, with a chronic condition regularly use um, a complementary medicine as part of their treatment. And many people state that arthritis itself is one of the top five reasons why they use or have tried a complementary medicine. There's a bit of literature about who might use complementary medicines, but in fact it's, it's conflicting. Um, so I think it, suffice to say that um, many Australians and many people across the world have tried or continue to use a complementary medicine. So what about if we just talk about osteoarthritis? Well, a lot of people with osteoarthritis have tried or used complementary medicines. So about 40% of Australians um, in a recent survey admit to using a complementary medicine. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any particular, again, gender or age difference. Actually, one of the things we know is that people with more knowledge or that self-rate their health as being very good are more likely to use a complementary medicine. And some of the things that are influence people either way seem to be family, friends or past experiences, particularly if people have had difficulty with what I would consider to be conventional medicines. Um, uh, that can initiate or um, have an effect on people persisting with the use of complementary medicines. What about in RA, which we can use sort of our, as our substitute for inflammatory arthritis? Close to 40% of people with RA have tried a complementary medicine. Um, in the US, it's much higher, um, just to kind of give you a, a rough idea of what's happening around the world. And certainly in Sweden, pretty similar um, similar statistics to ours. I've lost my video. Okay, I've got it back now, sorry about that. And what's really interesting is that half of the people who use complementary medicines don't discuss this with their um, treating uh, a doctor, whether that be GP, rheumatologist, whoever that might be. So why is it important? What are the things we need to think about with complementary medicines? Well, I think it's really important for all of us to think about the efficacy. That is, do they work? And for me, that means do they work according to rigorous published scientific data? So there's a difference between evidence and evidence, if you like. So what we consider to be rigorous published um, and scientific data are medicines that have gone through clinical trials that are well conducted and appropriate. And by that we mean have sufficient number of patients in the trials themselves, that those groups of patients are appropriate, that the intervention or the medicine is tested um, within one group versus what we call a placebo group. And a placebo is a group who will be receiving a sham medicine, if you like, so it which should look and um, feel and be the same as the medicine but not have the compound within it that we're testing. And ideally, sometimes you also need to test against something we know does work in a particular disease. Um, the patients need to be followed for a good enough period of time um, and the output that you look at at the end of the trial to decide whether the compound has made a difference or the medicine has worked needs to be a clinically meaningful endpoint. And I guess that means that it needs to be something that the people living with the disease will get a meaningful response from. And that's really, really important. And then crucial to that, to those trials, is that safety is attended to. And so that's the second point about what's important. Are these complementary medicines safe? And is there any data for this safety? And generally that comes from the clinical trials, but it also comes from run-on trials from the original trial and also from data that's collected over time in registries um, and other places. Interactions are really important, so we need to know whether these medicines are going to interact with other medicines that people might already be on or might need to have in the future. And then probably most crucially, really, it's about where to go to get more information. And we'll talk a bit about that towards the end um, tonight. So I'm going to start with osteoarthritis. A lot of people ask about fish oil. 
and if you walk down the aisle of um, your local pharmacy, there's fish oil everywhere, right? So let's talk about what evidence there is for a fish oil in osteoarthritis first of all. The first thing to say is that there are no placebo controlled trials of fish oil in osteoarthritis. There's actually been a lot of work done on um, fish oil in Australia um, and one of the groups um, that have published quite a bit of data on fish oil is from South Australia. And recently they published uh, a big trial with 200 patients which showed that if you took high dose versus low dose fish oil, there was some reduction, um, uh, although very minor, in pain and physical function at two years. But actually, very interestingly, higher versus lower didn't make any difference at all. And that's really the one good published paper that we do have. There's no evidence for any of the other oils that you might see um, or hear about um, publicised or within the pharmacy. So there's really insufficient evidence actually for fish oil in osteoarthritis. It's not recommended in any of the osteoarthritis guidelines. There doesn't, however, appear to be any adverse events in the trial um, that was published. We always caution people about fish oil in regard to the possible bleeding risk, although there's minimal evidence for that. But it is highlighted and so we do suggest, for example, if someone is on a blood thinning agent such as warfarin, that we need to keep a close eye on things. And I guess the biggest problem with fish oil is that people can get intolerances in terms of their tummy so they can get reflux and, and other symptoms. So one of the most common um, uh, compounds that are advertised and, and seen about is glucosamine. Now glucosamine it can be given by itself or in combination, generally with um, chondroitin and we'll talk about that in a moment. There is very conflicting data when it comes to glucosamine and unfortunately there's not any very good standalone studies. A lot of them are sponsored trials, so sponsored by the people that produce glucosamine. Most of them um, are in regards to knee osteoarthritis and, and I might say this is not unusual. Most of the clinical trials around osteoarthritis are in knee OA because the nature of osteoarthritis makes it very difficult to do the trials outside of something like knee osteoarthritis. But there was a Cochrane review in 2005. Now, a Cochrane review is a review um, that's published where the authors will look at all of the available evidence and then compound that evidence to, to, to come up with um, a, a sort of a conclusion putting all of the evidence together. Look, that review really didn't show, uh, it was conflicting. If you used one way of analysing the data, there was uh, a bit of an effect and if you used one way of analysing the data, there wasn't an effect. There was, however, a very good what we call randomised control trial back done in 2006, so quite some time ago now. It was, done, it was published in a, one of the, if not the, um, most reputable journals in the world called the New England Journal of Medicine. It had close to 1,600 patients, so it was a big size trial. They looked at glucosamine by itself or compared to placebo, compared to chondroitin by itself or compared to a combination of glucosamine and chondroitin. And at 24 weeks, they found that it was no better than placebo. So again, with glucosamine, there's what we would call inconsistent evidence. Again, it's not recommended in any of the guidelines. The very important thing to remember about glucosamine is that it's made from um, shellfish. And so if you, it should be absolutely avoided if you have any known allergy to shellfish, seafood or iodine. That's really important. We don't know that gluc glucosamine has a definite um, issue with anticoagulants, but there has been interactions with warfarin um, reported. What about chondroitin? There's really very limited evidence for um, chondroitin and it's, and it's quite unclear. Again, there was another Cochrane review done in 2015 um, and it showed a very small to moderate benefit. It seemed very safe, so there was actually a lower number of adverse events in the chondroitin group versus the placebo um, groups. But again, if you looked at the same randomised control trial, which was back from 2006, it again showed that there was no difference. There was, it was no better than placebo. So again, for chondroitin, there's insufficient evidence. It's not recommended, but there certainly didn't seem to be any adverse events um, in, with the use of chondroitin in the trial. What about the combination of the two? There has actually been 
quite a few trials and there's been quite a few people who've published putting those trials together to see what the evidence comes out as. I would say unfortunately a lot of them are sponsored. Um, there's issues with some of the endpoints, so that clinical endpoint about what might be relevant to patients. Um, but there are a lot of randomised controlled trials. Now I've listed for you on this slide quite a lot of them. Uh, essentially the best trial is again this one that was published in the New England which didn't show anything better than placebo. Um, there's been a number of analyses where they've put multiple um, uh, trials together without showing any um, particular evidence. So for the combination there's really what we would call insufficient and conflicting evidence. So again it's therefore not recommended in any of the guidelines. There were really very minimal adverse events in this, in this study but again there's just this caution um, in regards to, to, to allergy and the warfarin. So if we move to rheumatoid arthritis, um, is there any evidence for fish oil in rheumatoid arthritis? Well, there are a number of trials. Again, a number of these have come out of South Australia, so they're Australian trials. Um, if you take, if you go right back to 95, there was a trial that looked at um, fish oil versus placebo. Um, then there was another meta-analysis that looked at putting a few of the smaller trials together. Then there was quite a decent sized um, randomised control and another randomised control. And the base, the, the, the output of all of those trials is actually that there, some, there does seem to be an effect with fish oil and rheumatoid arthritis which as you would all know is very different to osteoarthritis because in rheumatoid arthritis is what we call an inflammatory arthritis. And in RA what seems to happen is there does seem to be a decreased amount of tender joints. There seems to be a little bit of drop of stiffness, early morning stiffness which is fairly common in rheumatoid arthritis and it allowed some people to stop using their anti-inflammatory medications. So their non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, they were able to discontinue the use of those. So on, the, on that background, the therapeutic guidelines um, from 2015 do suggest that there is some evidence for fish oil. It has a mild anti-inflammatory effect in rheumatoid arthritis. The important thing about this though is that you have to take it in a high enough dose. So you have to take 2.7 grams of omega-3 EPA poached DHA. So that is essentially 9 to 15 tablets of the 1,000 milligram tablets that you see um, generally in the pharmacy and you have to look very closely to see the amount of omega-3 and you've got to get to 2.7 for it to have a difference. Alternatively, some people take the concentrated fish oil um, liquid because you're able to get that concentration. And there's also a bit of a caveat that you probably have to take it for three months before you'll see an effect. So there is some evidence for use in um, rheumatoid arthritis. It is, however, given the very minor effect, not recommended in the big European or the big American guidelines. Again, there seem to be very minimal adverse events in any of these trials, um, but you just need to bear in, in mind the potential um, risk uh, related to um, blood thinners, um, and mostly the, the, the limiting thing with fish oil is the amount that you have to take and then it can cause some, um, some GI upsets and some gastrointestinal upset. With all of the other complementary medicines of which I've just listed a few here, there is insufficient evidence. So for all of these compounds as many as well as many others, there isn't what we would consider to be any rigorous scientific evidence that any of these make a difference to um, people living with RA. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about other over-the-counter medicines. Paracetamol is of course a very common medicine. It's been around for a very long time and it's often used um, and prescribed to people as well as used over-the-counter of course. What we know in terms of osteoarthritis is that, that it does confer a small benefit for a short time. But actually most recently there's been some very large and well publicised trials, you might have seen some information about this in the media, because these large trials and these large analysis of multiple trials have started to come to the conclusion actually that paracetamol is quite ineffective in musculoskeletal pain. So it's not effective in treating lower back pain and probably doesn't have a place actually for 
a clinically relevant benefit in osteoarthritis. And this is actually quite a change um, in, in evidence because in the past, of course, we've, we have suggested to, to people that they, use, um, that they use paracetamol, but this is certainly a changing space and, and this has really been on the back of a couple of very large pivotal trials over the last couple of years. There's really minimal evidence for paracetamol in the inflammatory arthritis um, and it's, it's unclear whether if you combine it with an anti-inflammatory whether it makes much difference. So what about anti-inflammatories? There is good published data that in both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, anti-inflammatories of various types, of which there are many, are effective. Um, and a very large trial published in um, a very um, uh, uh, large journal called The Lancet in 2016 and 2017 showed the definite benefit. And there's been some, again, some large reviews that have looked at all of the data to suggest that's the, that is the case. Unfortunately, anti-inflammatories are often contraindicated. So we can often not use anti-inflammatories and that's because of the potential for cardiovascular side effects, so problems with hypertension, um, having heart attacks, having strokes, and then gastrointestinal problems. So you can get both irritation and reflux and you can get bleeding and, and sort of catastrophic issues with anti-inflammatories. So they're actually difficult drugs to use, particularly in the setting of people having other medical problems or possible other medical problems. So they're tricky to use. But we do know that they, they, they confer some benefit if you're able to take them. What is good news actually is that topical anti-inflammatories are effective. And they are very safe because, of course, we don't run into any of the, the side effects like we do um, as anti-inflammatories that are taken as a tablet. So the good news about topical um, uh, NSAIDs is that there is um, some trial evidence for uh, in osteoarthritis um, and there is some trial evidence in um, chronic musculoskeletal pain. So this is often an option for people who can't take the anti-inflammatories because of um, contraindications or interactions. So that brings us on to um, discuss codeine. Um, and I've taken from the TGA website, this, these slides are taken directly from the TGA website about what's happening. But for those that are not aware um, or need some further explanation in this space, the TGA or the Therapeutic Goods Administration made a decision um, this year that all medicines containing codeine will not be available anymore over the counter. So you will you will require a script from a doctor to get access to any medicines with codeine. And as stated on the website, this is really about the increasing issues associated to what we call opioid drug use. And codeine is a type of opioid medicine. Um, and opioids are the drugs related to morphine. And over time, we've noted that there's been increasing harmful effects from the use of opioid-containing medicines. Um, and codeine itself can start to cause um, these issues, including opioid tolerance and dependence, um, certainly addiction in high doses. There can be lots of difficulties. And there's been lots of um, uh, evidence looking at hospital admissions um, related to, to codeine use and to opioid use. So, that's the rationale, that's the reason that, that the TGA has, um, has taken this step. Now what will be affected? Everything that has codeine in it. So some people don't actually realise that codeine's in a lot of things. So there's a number of painkillers that codeine is in of course and there's a number of brand names. There's a number of combination um, uh, analgesics as well or painkillers as well. So there's the combination with with anti-inflammatory, there's the combination with Panadol. So there's a number of brand names and a number of different combinations that the codeine is in. And then codeine's also often um, in cold and flu medicines, in, um, in cough syrup and um, uh, similar um, medicines. And so again, there's a number of, of brands um, uh, where these will no longer be available um, over the counter at the chemist. Now a lot of people use codeine um, containing medicines and many of these people have musculoskeletal pain, chronic pain, inflammatory arthritis, osteoarthritis, etc. So it's really important um, and my advice 
to anybody who uses codeine containing products for their pain is that you really need to have a plan in place because this is going to come into effect in February. And so what I would say to you is it's time to start talking to your healthcare providers about um, a plan. Um, and so there are a number of ways of going about that. Um, and you know, this might mean a discussion with your GP or your rheumatologist or your pain specialist um, about uh, the codeine medicines that you use and whether there's any substitutions for those um, codeine tablets or how you might manage the prescriptions needing you to, to attend the, the doctors free, more frequently than you otherwise would. It might mean um, a referral to a pain clinic for um, those substitutions or for the management and it might mean starting of course the conversation about other pain management um, tools um, including you know, um, input from health, allied health professionals and otherwise. The one other point that is made on the website which I think is really important is um, to talk to your doctor about, and this you need to discuss this with your GP about a chronic health, um, a chronic disease management plan and that management plan will allow you to access um, rebates for a number of, for example, allied health professional visits. So that might be physiotherapy, um, that might be podiatry, etc. So that plan, you need to get that in place via a GP um, and that will allow you um, to access um, some of the other allied health um, things that might be of benefit to you. So look, I think the really important thing is just to be aware that this is going to happen. It is going to happen in February. There won't be any period of time where there's any grace shown or otherwise. Come, you know, the 1st of February of time where there's any grace shown or otherwise. Come, you know, the 1st of February, these changes will go into effect. So you really need to be prepared and, and I think it's time if you're able to sort of start preparing for that now. And lastly, before we take some questions, it's really important to know where to go for more information. Now, um, in general, when you're looking for information about medicines, there's a lot of places to go. Arthritis Queensland is obviously a great first um, uh, place to go and you can go to the website and there's a number of links with reputable um, uh, sources of information. But remember that you're also able to access Arthritis Queensland through the helpline um, and you can discuss um, issues with the, with the healthcare providers over the phone um, and they may be able to point you in the right direction and give you some um, further advice. In regards to complementary um, medicines, there are some really great websites that I have found to be helpful and I've highlighted them in red. Um, and I just want to show you some of the information that you can get from those websites. So the first one is the National Centre for Complementary and Integrative Health. Now I'm sure that these pictures don't come out so well on your slide. But this is, a, this is a website from the States, the NIH, the NIH is the National Institute of Health um, in the US and when you go to this website which you can just access directly, you can punch in any um, disease type, you can put in for example fibromyalgia, you can put in rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, chronic pain and what, it, what will come up for you is all of the evidence that is currently available and it's routinely updated um, uh, at an excellent time frame, all of the current evidence for any complementary or alternative medicines available for that particular um, disease entity. And it gives a very thorough rundown um, of any available evidence and that's actually pharmacological drugs or non-pharmacological. So for example, things like acupuncture, therapy, all of those sorts of things, it will actually give you the latest evidence um, uh, on that website. I think it's a really good place to go. The second website is if you're looking for particular information on a particular herb or a particular compound and sometimes I've put turmeric as an example there because sometimes patients will ask me about particular compounds. Now if they're not published in, in scientific journals or otherwise I won't know about them but what is important is, is we might need to know if there's any potential for them to interact with other medicines or um, uh, uh, cause any other issues. And so you can go to this website which is the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. So this is a very large cancer centre that established this um, website. 
Um, and it's really fantastic. What you do at this website is you can put in a particular compound. So that might be turmeric, that might be glucosamine, it might be um, wood bark, it, 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 could, it could be anything. If there's information on it, it will be on this website. Um, and the great thing about it is that it will give you um, any of the detail that we know, uh, that is known about the, the, the way this, med, this compound might work in the body and what it may or may not do. Um, but it really importantly gives you all of the potential interactions that are known about and any of the safety issues that are known about. So th this is a really great place to go. And the final um, one that um, I sometimes direct people to is Arthritis UK, which is really the equivalent of, of Arthritis Queensland and similar consumer groups in the UK. They've produced a number of fact sheets about a whole number of different complementary therapies. And again, you can go to the website, you can punch in, for, I've just used flaxseed oil as an example. They've reviewed all of the most current evidence and they use a two rating system. So they'll use a rating system of one to five for the effectiveness, that's looking at any published data. And then they use a, a green light, orange light, amber light system for safety. So if there's any known safety um, uh, evidence or events, then, um, then that'll be an orange. Um, if, there's, if there's no known safety uh, worries or otherwise, then it'd be a green, meaning green light. Um, but it's a very easy, that they produce very easy to read, well described um, uh, evidence about um, a whole number of, of, of complementary medicines. I can't tell you how many are on there, but, but quite a lot when I had a look. So it's another really good place to go. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I have purposely left quite a bit of time for questions. Um, and so James, I think I'll hand it back over to you to see if we can start answering some of the questions. Is that coming through? I think it is. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Benham. That was very, very interesting. Firstly, one of the things Dr. Benham mentioned was um, the chronic disease management plans and that's something that we in the health education team promote a lot. Gets you able to see a number of different um, health professionals to become involved in your care um, and a lot of these have a strong focus on pain management as well. So just on that um, Dr. Benham, is there any within the chronic disease management space and the, the allied health space, is there any therapies that do have a strong evidence base, non-medication based or otherwise, that you recommend or encourage people to explore through something like a chronic disease management plan? Great question and, and it depends on the disease that you're living with. Um, so let's talk about what we've talked about tonight. In osteoarthritis, we know that Actually, non-pharmacological management or non-drug management has much better evidence than any sort of medicine that you can take. So actually, there's very good evidence for exercise of many types. There's very good evidence for weight loss. There's actually very, there's evidence for biomechanical intervention. So that might mean a trip to the podiatrist. Um, uh, and in terms of your exercise, a trip to an exercise um, uh, therapist or to a physiotherapist might be on the cards. Um, there's also some evidence for the use of walking canes or, or other things that might help people. So again, that might be in the occupational therapy space. If we talk about something like fibromyalgia, again, we know that non-drug things do have good evidence. So exercise definitely has good evidence. Graded exercise, so a light exercise load and that's in the water or on land. Um, and again, you know, um, a, physiotherapy may, a physiotherapist in hydrotherapy may be able to give you a specific plan that you can then implement um, uh, uh, for, for things like fibromyalgia. We increasingly know that mindfulness and um, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy for fibromyalgia might be helpful. So again, a psychologist can be accessed. So to be honest with you, depending on the disease entity, there's lots of different places to go to for um, other assistance that's got good evidence behind it. So I agree with you so much, James. I think it's just really important that people know about the chronic um, um, disease management plans um, and they get their GPs to um, get them enrolled so that they can access all of these things. And if you can't access a chronic disease program for whatever reason, just to be aware that there, there is a whole lot of non-medicine things that you can do um, to, to help you. Fantastic. 
Yeah, and there was just a quick question came through then as well, which I'll just quickly answer about chronic disease management plans. You, you organise them through your GP. So my advice would be phone your GP and just let them know over the phone that that's what you're coming in for. Sometimes they do require a little bit of a longer appointment to put it all together. So phone your GP um, and just let them know that that's what you're coming in for. Um, Okay, a couple of the other questions we had come in. Um, one was, um, it, was it wasn't related necessarily to over-the-counter therapies or natural therapies, um, but it was saying, have there been any studies done on low-dose methotrexate for inflammatory forms of arthritis? Um, Dr. Benham. So, great question. There is excellent evidence for the use of methotrexate in inflammatory arthritis. There's more evidence for methotrexate than any other medication that we have to use for inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and the key answer to that question is that it's used in low doses. So sometimes there can be some confusion about methotrexate because it is a medicine that is used for other purposes. And, and one of those purposes, which is really scary for patients, is that it's used um, for some cancer treatment. And really, the difference there is that the methotrexate is used at a very high dose, so sometimes 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams, and often um, via a different, um, uh, not given as a tablet, but given as an infusion or, or other ways. When we use methotrexate for conditions like psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, we use a dose that is weekly and somewhere in the range between usually 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams, so vastly different to those at 2,000. So there's often confusion about the use of methotrexate, but really methotrexate is a pivotal medication um, that is uh, known to have really good um, efficacy, so it works really well. Like any medicine, there is the potential for side effects, um, and people will often run into trouble with methotrexate um, with side effects. We get everybody who takes methotrexate to also take folic acid or folate, the vitamin folate, and that often prevents the side effects related to methotrexate. But it's a, it, it, is a, it is a pivotal drug and one that's really worth um, discussing with your rheumatologist um, about using inflammatory arthritis. Fantastic, thank you. Um, another thing that's commonly used for pain management particularly are hot and cold therapy. So another form of non-pharmaceutical um, pain relief. Is there a better time to use heat versus cold? Um, some people often, a, a lady has mentioned on the chat here, but I quite often get it through our helpline that they're, you know, apply, um, asking when is the best, um, best time or at what stage do you use hot versus cold? Do you have anything to say on that, Dr. Benham? I, you know, patients ask me this a lot as well. Uh, there isn't any clear evidence uh, to, to, to give a very scientific answer to that. Um, you know, traditionally with acute injuries, we use the RICE, which is rest, ice, compression, elevation. So ice has always been in that acute kind of care. So extrapolated from that, people will often say that if you've got an acutely inflamed joint, then ice is the right thing to do. Um, we know that um, conversely, when people have chronic musculoskeletal pain, um, chronic um, back pain for example or otherwise, heat packs are very beneficial to people. So because there's no right or wrong answer and because there is no harm in the use of a heat pack or a cold pack as long as your heat pack's not too hot and your cold pack's not going to make you hit the roof, then really you use what makes you feel best. Um, and so you use hot and cold in, in whatever way um, improves your symptoms. There, there isn't a right or a wrong way to go about it. Fan, fantastic. Now just on to a few ones that um, were um, on the various types of natural therapies out there. Um, someone had asked if you had seen anything on green-lipped muscles um, at all. Um, to my knowledge, they are part of the omega-3 fatty acid promoting um, natural therapies, but have you heard anything specifically on green lip muscles and OA, RA or any type of arthritis, them having any particular um, benefit at all? 
Yeah, so a few years ago, green lip muscle, um, there were a number of um, small trials. Um, I wouldn't say that there were any excellent large randomised control trials, but there have been a number of trials on green lipped muscle, um, both in osteoarthritis and some small trials in inflammatory arthritis, and they were shown to, to not be um, conclusively helpful. Um, there are a number of um, uh, publications like the, the Arthritis UK, I noticed that it has green lip muscle. You, you will find a lot of um, discussion threads um, and, uh, and otherwise on green lip muscles, but unfortunately there, there isn't any good robust scientific evidence um, for its use. Okay, and I guess similarly, the, um, another question on rose hip powder, which um, again, to my knowledge, is something that's relatively high in vitamin C or acts to um, have an antioxidant uh, effect on the body or contain antioxidant properties. Um, is there any evidence around that one in particular, rosehip powder or vitamin C or antioxidant promoting um, natural therapies? Or is there, is there some kind of, what's, what's the idea, I guess, behind the antioxidant promoting therapies and their effect on the body and rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, if there is any? So again, there's no high quality clinical trials that have shown any evidence for any of those compounds. However, what I would say to you is, is that the thought behind it, of course, is grounded in some science. So um, antioxidants are thought, as the name suggests, um, to reduce oxidative stress. And oxidative stress in cells, so in cellular material, causes problems. And we know that um, uh, stress within cells is there when people have inflammatory arthritis or, or even an osteoarthritis and otherwise. So the, the basis of trying to reverse that is, is, is clear in its, um, in its um, uh, I guess, process of thinking. The problem has looked like traditionally that the oral bioavailability of, of compounds that have an antioxidant effect mostly limits their clinical effectiveness. And what I mean by that is that you can't take enough of it for it to get to that cell level for it to have an effect. Um, and so that's why the trials with these medicines have not been, have not shown any benefit and why they haven't gone on to, to bigger, larger, you know, um, uh, appropriately numbered trials and things. So there is, in research, you know, it would be a, a wonderful thing for us to find a compound that we could um, use as an antioxidant. The other, the other evidence we know behind this is that there is, is some evidence over time for, um, you know, people ask about diet um, uh, as, um, as whether there's any influence. Now, unfortunately, again, there's no good robust scientific evidence, and I've said this quite a few times tonight, but unfortunately there's not. With diet, the reason for that mostly is that it's very hard to do the trials, it's very hard to to, to even retrospectively or go back and look at, at what has happened with people on particular trials. So it's hard to get the evidence. But you know, there's this suggestion in cardiovascular disease that, for example, you're more protected if you have Mediterranean type diet because of the antioxidant effect and otherwise. So, so there's good rationale behind um, antioxidant effects of food and, um, and drugs and things. But at the moment, there just is not the evidence for, for use of any of those. Thank you, Dr. Benham. And just um, touching on what was just mentioned then in terms of diet, so definitely a good, healthy, balanced diet. It's going to, if anything, it's going to give your body the best chance, I guess, of possibly minimising some of the impacts of arthritis. But it's also um, needs to be mentioned that there is an association, I believe, between um, some forms of arthritis and cardiovascular disease. And we know the, the role diet plays in the, um, the management of cardiovascular disease. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, did you have anything to add, Dr. Benham, on the relationship between some forms of arthritis and cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so I'll say two things to what you've just said, James. By far and away, one of the clear things that makes a difference to people's outcome with arthritis is keeping or getting their weight into a healthy weight range. Um, we know that for sure 
weight loss is helpful for osteoarthritis. We know in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis that weight loss or having your weight in a healthy weight range means you'll do much better. You'll respond to the medicines, um, you'll have a better outcome over time, you'll have less issues with infections and various other things. So there is huge benefit to using your diet to help you maintain your healthy weight. It's really crucial and it's not just about less loading on your joints, which obviously is an easy thing for us to all understand. If there's less weight going through our knee, then there should be less pain and that's absolutely true. But actually metabolically, there is a huge advantage to losing weight if you're not within the healthy range or maintaining your weight if you are in the healthy range. And so then that leads us to this association between cardiovascular disease and inflammatory arthritis. And we've known about this for a few years and it's increasingly on the radar now. So um, there is a direct association. We don't understand why that is. We currently presume that it has to do with the inflammatory load affecting the, um, vessel, the blood vessels that supply your heart, for example, and other places are um, inflamed or have an inflammatory process similar to what's going on in the joints or other places. But for sure what we do know is that your increased risk of premature cardiovascular disease, for example in rheumatoid arthritis, is much elevated. And so um, keeping your weight in a healthy range and choosing diet that is of a healthy nature um, and just like you've mentioned with all of the healthy food groups and otherwise, rather than a particular diet with a particular um, uh, uh, fruit or vegetable or otherwise, um, will have an important impact for both your arthritis but also your risk of cardiovascular disease down the track. Does that answer your question? Fantastic. Um, it was just asked through the um, chat a, a few points ago now, but um, there's a few people out there that claim that they've found a cure or have something that can reverse the damage caused by various types of arthritis. It, to your knowledge in terms of both the non-inflammatory and the inflammatory side of the equation. Um, is there a cure on the market at the moment? Um, or um, if, uh, if not, is, is there work being done to pursue that um, at the moment? You can rest assured that if I was a cure, I'd be shouting it from the rooftops and making sure that every one of my patients and everybody else had access to it. Um, and that Arthritis Queensland had it plastered all over their website. Unfortunately, no, we don't have a cure to uh, any of the uh, current musculoskeletal diseases that we've discussed tonight. However, we do have a lot of very good treatment schedules, which includes medicines and doesn't include non-medicines, for the treatment of all of the things that we've talked about tonight. So I would hate for anybody to think that we need to wait for a cure, because we don't need to wait for a cure. We need to use the things that we have now to help you get into remission, to improve your daily life and to pr improve your outcome over time and, and how will you, you will be in the future um, by getting on top, of the, on top of the diseases. But it is really important to say that there are many researchers working away um, to try and find cures. Um, you may or may know that Arthritis Queensland has for a long time supported um, Professor Ranjani Thomas um, her work is trying to find a cure for rheumatoid arthritis. We have a number of hugely talented researchers working in um, genetics who are trying to understand the genes that um, are influencing what happens in arthritis and, and therefore work out ways of, of, of trying to find a cure using that path. Um, there are many researchers working in osteoarthritis looking at cartilage and how cartilage um, can be reprogrammed or, or, or what we can do to try and reverse or prevent the effects of osteoarthritis. So look, as a rheumatologist and as a researcher I remain very optimistic that there's lots of really good research going on in Australia but also um, uh, across the world trying to strive towards a cure because we do have many good therapies now and many good treatments so we don't want to wait, we don't want anybody to wait for a cure, we want everybody to be as well as they could possibly be but also really to have hope that actually some big breakthroughs have happened in the last 10 to 20 years and I really expect that that will continue to be the case and when we get closer um, over the next few years. 
Oh, fantastic. Um, in terms of those current treatments, we've had a couple of questions come through about the research behind and I guess the appropriate use of um, drugs like prednisone. Um, is there anything on that, how they might have, that might differ from some of the other treatments that you've um, mentioned tonight um, and how it's typically used, I guess, I know everyone's different in terms of their arthritis management, how something like that would typically be used in, um, in rheumatology? So prednisone is not an over-the-counter therapy. It's it's a, it's very much a prescribed um, medicine. It's what we call a corticosteroid. Um, so it's a steroid medication. So it's a really high-powered anti-inflammatory is how it works, and it is a drug that works fast and it works um, uh, uh, extremely efficient. And so we often use prednisone. Um, in the acute stages um, of, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. It's used in a number of inflammatory muscle conditions. It's used in a number of inflammatory um, vessel conditions called vasculitis. It's got lots of indications. But unfortunately, prednisone or corticosteroids are a necessary evil. So they, um, in the longer term, have terrible um, side effects. And so we use prednisone or corticosteroids very judiciously. We use them at the lowest dose for the least amount of time as we possibly can. And it's really important that a medicine like prednisone is not used outside your prescribed. And it's really important that a medicine like prednisone is not used outside your prescribed, the way you've had it prescribed. Because the more the dose, for the longer the period of time or the intermittent use that um, uh, might not have been prescribed to you, can result in lots of side effects. And those side effects include, but are not, not um, uh, exhaustive because the list is long, but um, uh, can cause um, you to develop diabetes, will cause you to put a lot of weight on, can cause you to get cataracts, can cause lots of metabolic disturbances as well as diabetes um, related to your blood pressure and cardiovascular risk and otherwise. You can bruise very easily, it can cause bleeding, and I could go on and on. There's unfortunately a, a big long list of why prednisone um, needs to be used very carefully. So I guess the main take home message with prednisone is yes, we do use it. Yes, it, it often is a crucial part of what we need to do, particularly when a disease is um, very, very active and out of control but it needs to be used very carefully and you should um, uh, really discuss this very carefully and be very clear of what your plan is um, um, if you're ever prescribed prednisone. Oh, thank you very um, much, Dr. Um, Benneman. Sorry, I've seen there's a lot more questions come through, which is fantastic, um, but we are out of time for this evening. So if anyone at all um, has any further questions or wants to follow up on anything from this evening, please feel free to um, call us on our one 800 Zero double one zero four one helpline number, or feel free to drop us an info at uh, sorry an email at info at arthritis .org .au. And myself um, or my colleague Paula will be able to answer those to the best of our ability. And like Helen mentioned, there's a lot of um, good resources out there regarding prescription and non-prescription medicines. Um, the Australian Rheumatology Association's website, our website at Arthritis Queensland and also the ones that Helen listed on those slides um, are really good places to start. Um, we did record this um, uh, webinar as well, so if you did have any issues with the sound or the picture quality or anything or it dropped out, we will be posting up um, a link of it up on our Facebook page and website in the near future, so keep an eye out on those. Um, and just a final thing, as you close out of this uh, webinar, a quick survey will come up. If you could please take a couple of minutes to fill that out. Um, we put a lot of effort into planning these webinars and we want to make sure that they remain something that's relevant for you and that you continue to enjoy. So if you wouldn't mind taking the time to fill that out, that would be much appreciated. But from us here uh, tonight, um, thank you again so much for um, taking the time to listen to our webinar. It's been um, fantastic to see so many of you online. And a big thank you again to Dr. Benham for um, taking the time to speak to us about the, the interesting but tricky world of uh, complementary medicines and over-the-counter therapies for arthritis. So thank you again and good night.